What's going on? It's the Joey Show. This is Joey Avery. Special episode today. We don't have a guest, folks. So we're going to try something a little different. I want to try something today uh, called uh, News Sports Internet. All right? We're going to grab a story from each of the three. We have something from the sports world. Don't worry. It's interesting even if you're not into sports. We have something from the news world, an article that uh, really fascinated me. And then uh, a little bit of discourse that's going on in the internet. No guests today, folks. Um, honestly, excited to try this out. Also, had a bail, had like three days in New York, and I'm, I'm back on the road. Uh, thanks to everyone who came out in Florida, by the way. Hell of a goddamn time. Miami. What a town. Si se puede. I don't even, uh, that, that's not even Miami at all. But it was that kind of vibe down there. You go down there and you just, you just kind of, I just wanted to, honestly, this Shakira shirt that I'm wearing fits very well. My hips were moving and they did not lie. It was very nice down there. I liked it. A lot of, a lot of flavor. Some really great Cuban food. Uh, Miami kicks ass. Uh, oh, and then also, um, want to talk a little bit about the Curb Your Enthusiasm finale, and in the spirit of Larry David, uh, I'm introducing a new segment called Soapbox. So I had a guest on, a secret guest. I know I said no guest today, but this is a secret guest. This is not someone in entertainment. This is just a person with an important thought. And that's a platform I want to give to you guys, my massive throngs of fans and listeners, this massive platform. Uh, But I do, obviously I want to keep having interviews with comedians and entertainers and and that sort of thing but I honestly sometimes we'll just be out at a bar and my friend will be start ranting about something random and I'm like that's what I want to hear about so today we have a soapbox rant and I really want to tell you the topic now but I'm not going to because I'm going to save it and I'm going to make it special but let's get into some uh news sports internet thank god I hear the podcast Quite an article today, or that I came across today, uh, in Time Magazine, uh, in the health portion, around health and aging, and the article is called, Pregnancy Can Make You Age Faster. So, uh, look, it's science. Hey, it's science. We should all, we should all take in potential scientific learnings. We should discuss them. Uh, What the fuck is the point of doing this one? This is one of those that just kind of creeped me out. You know, it's like when you see those articles and they're like, you don't need to own anything, you're going to rent. And you're like, what are you guys doing here? Uh, pregnancy can can make you age faster. Okay. Cool. What's your point? We kind of need to have kids, do we not? Uh, look, there was a study uh, done in the Philippines, apparently. And what's interesting here is, look, they found overall that women who had been pregnant at least once were biologically older than women of the same age who had not been pregnant. Pregnancy led to anywhere from four months to more than a year of faster aging at a rate of about 3% per year, more than women who had never been pregnant. Who the fuck didn't think that? Like, seriously, what is the point? Are you saying that doing something that is hard on your body can be hard on your body? I was just very astounded by this article. Like, what's the takeaway? Like, is that the world that we're heading towards? Are we supposed to be like, you know what? Yeah, I want to look young and hot, so I'm not going to have kids. Yeah, people who are obsessed with that aren't doing that anyway. They bury this like five paragraphs later in the article. They go, oh, yeah, actually, there is a regenerative effect that we don't necessarily have. Uh, conclusive evidence on, but roughly three months after the pregnancy, some people see it trending back. So why even write the article if you don't have the goods on this? It's just kind of creepy. It's like, dude, do you not want people having kids? Like, you're highlighting something that's relatively obvious. Yes, of course. Pregnancy is hard on the body. Also, you know what probably makes you age faster? Having the fucking kids. If your main goal is just being young and hot forever, yeah, probably don't have something that takes up all of your time and energy and ruins your sleep cycles, but maybe, just maybe, there are things more important than your biological age. It's a very strange, bizarre article where it's like, is that, who's doing that study? 
Like, what what is the point? I guess maybe you could argue. Maybe they're saying that you could, if you understand how aging works, you could come up with uh, better ways to counteract it. But this is just one of those articles that creeps me out. Like, it's like, what are you pushing people towards? Bro, we need to have kids. Have I had kids? No, okay. I am trying to stay young and hot for a while longer. Am I going to have to have kids eventually? Yes. Is it going to affect my body? Not during the pregnancy, no. But, in fact, what if, I, what if I'm one of those good guys who's like, I, we're pregnant, and... Therefore, I am not going to drink. And then so it's possible that pregnancy could actually make me twice as hot. So in that sense, another another article may be there. Uh, I just, yeah, these are just things that I, I, I don't like seeing this sort of thing because I don't really understand the point. It's not surprising. It's not interesting. And it's kind of weird. Um, but, you know, that's fine. Uh, shout out to pregnant ladies. How about that? I'm, I'm at the age now where I actually, uh, I, I encounter a lot more of it. Looks hard. Thanks for doing that. That's the real, I think, I know I can speak for a lot of guys when I say, I can't imagine doing that. And it almost makes me feel bad feeling like I'm going to make someone else do that. Okay, so we don't need more articles like this. How about this, Time Magazine? Here's your, here's your health article. Being pregnant can make you a superhero. Being pregnant can do what humanity needs, which is keep us going. Being pregnant is beautiful. It's a gift of life. How about that? Not it's going to make you older. You think there's not enough insecurity around that? Hey, newsflash, Time Magazine. Being pregnant makes you gain weight during the nine-month period. You fucks. Let these beautiful... Let these beautiful... Beautiful pregnant souls continue on, ladies. I think it's a beautiful thing. Although I will say, the the pregnant photo shoot can be a bit much. Obviously, do it, document it, whatever. But I was out. I was out. I was back in California. I was running along the beach, and there was just a woman out there just holding her belly in front of the beach while the husband was like squatting down, taking ten thousand. Uh, Instagram photos, and I I was like, that is a little odd, but it, it kind of reminds me of how I feel when my boys are taking a photo of me, like at the end of of a trip. You know, you've been eating you've been eating burgers and fries and drinking by the pool for three days, and your boys taking a photo of you, and you're just kind of like, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful what I've made here? That that shit ages you faster. Uh, okay, that's news. That is news. There was a lot of other news, but to be honest with you, uh, I a lot of the news is very serious, and I feel like if I'm going to dive into that, I need to add something. So this one, this one was more a bone to pick with a news article, but let's move on to sports. Shohei Otani. It's a story you've probably heard. Uh, Shohei Otani was the uh, he played for the Angels. He came over from Japan. He can pitch. He can hit. Okay, he's like the Babe Ruth of the modern era, but he's Japanese. Uh, I believe we were <laughs> at the forum. Derek Post and called him the Great Bamboo Stick. So that's a beautiful that's a beautiful thing. The Yellow Babe. But look, he. He got involved in something a lot of people have heard about. This is the whole thing with his interpreter and the betting scandal. That's not what we're going to talk about today. Because there's another scandal that did not get nearly as much coverage. But we're starting to get a picture of this guy. And look, I'm going to be the first to say it. When he was on the Angels, I was a fan. I was like, this is such a cool thing. What a generational thing. I will be honest. I'm from the Bay Area. I'm a Giants fan. Now that he's on the Dodgers, he can eat a plate of shit. He can eat a plate of shit. We can serve it raw. We can do it sushi grade, but you can eat shit, you fuck face. No offense. Not biased here in my news coverage. Uh, brief overview of the betting story because that's been well covered. That's not what we want to discuss. There was this whole thing that happened right when uh, the season was starting where his interpreter was caught giving $4.5 million to a bookie, which is not great. And the interpreter first said, oh, Shohei knew about it. He knew I was in trouble. He was helping me cover my debts. That turned out 
not to be true, quote unquote, or they circle the wagons through this guy under the bus. They're saying he stole four point five million dollars. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that. Um, but apparently he did. I guess if you're his interpreter, you, you maybe have to talk to the bank or something like that. That would be the being interpreter is kind of a cool gig. Honestly, for somebody rich, just don't do four point five million. And if you can steal four point five million, don't bet. There's a hot take, but maybe he was in some hot water, some ramen. Um, either way, Shohei now is involved in something else. This was covered in the LA Times. I also want to give a shout-out to Eric Burns, which is where I first saw this, uh, of No Filter Network. He, uh, he covered this on Instagram. Shohei did something else weird, or at least the Dodgers did, which doesn't surprise me because the Dodgers are an entire organization uh, worth of bottom-feeding asshats who deserve all the playoff failures that they've been getting. That's, I think that's... I think that's unbiased. I think that's fair. I don't think that I don't think we even really even need to, to discuss that. Um, so Shohei hits a historic home run. His first home run is a Dodger, historic to some, uh, and it is caught by some diehard Dodgers fans. So exciting! They caught Shohei's ball, but then the Dodgers are like, "Hey, we're gonna need that back," and they're kind of like, "Well, you know." You catch something that, that's worth a lot of money. We're not his interpreter. We can't just get four point five million out of his account. It might be nice for us to get a little uh, cash here. We could sell this thing. And so the Dodgers are like, no, give it back. They start pressuring these fans, these diehard fans, who go all the way out to Chavez Ravine, day in, day out. They pay whatever it is, $12 for a Dodger dog. How much does it cost for a Dodger dog? Price for a Dodger dog. I bet it's $12 they're paying. Okay, 6.5, but you're going to have two. You're going to have to. 6.5, what meat is in that? This is why I don't like hot dogs. That's no, you, 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 a throat rocket for 6.5, what type of meat's in that? You feel good about that? We wonder why asshole cancer is on the rise. Dodger dogs. Anyway, they're diehard fans. They go to Chavez Ravine. They buy the Dodger dogs. They buy a beer. Now, that's 12, 15, all right? They go all the way out there. They love it. They, you know, you want to support your team. Really, you never want to meet the people who work for your team's organization, almost ever. Once you realize that your team is a company run by people and you've met people who run any company, you go, oh, no. But either way, they are fans of the Dodgers. They catch this home run ball. What a fucking moment. And the Dodgers are like, you're going to give that to us. And we're going to give you some memorabilia. I think it was uh, like two, two bats, two bats, a helmet, some jerseys, like a decent amount of, uh, of, of Shohei. The fan here, um, Mr. Valenzuela, Fernando Valenzuela, um, he, uh, he said it was a nightmare. He said it started out so good, then it ended in a hustle. A hustle from a multi-billion dollar organization who just paid this man all that they're paying him. And they're hustling. These motherfuckers, these people who pay 6.5 for those cancer-ridden throat rockets and go consistently, day in, day out, to every game. So they offer them some Shohei memorabilia. And they're like, well, that's not really like a, a great deal. And then the Dodgers say, we're not going to authenticate this baseball. Meaning we won't, like, we have to be the ones who say this is actually the one. We're not going to do that for you. So it's not going to be as valuable as you think it would be. And so the Dodgers are like, oh, yeah, we gave them some stuff. We got the ball back, and they got to meet Shohei. Well, it turns out they never wanted to do it. The Dodgers said they wouldn't authenticate the baseball. So the memorabilia they got, I think uh, I think Eric, who I mentioned, estimated it was worth 10 k and the ball is already estimated to be 100 k could maybe be more. Till they throw this rat fucking jail. Um, <laughs> used to love this guy. Um, either way, turns out the Dodgers hustled them and they didn't even get to meet Shohei Otani. So it's been a really rocky start for kind of the one thing that baseball was really excited to have, which is this generational talent doing something that hasn't been done in so many years and now doing it in a huge market in LA with these dedicated fans. This is going to be so fun. He's on the best team ever. And it starts off, boom, gambling scandal, boom, hits a home run. That can't even be fun. And you know what that tells me? It's what I always suspected. The Dodgers are all pieces of shit, not biased. 
just a Giants fan who hates the Dodgers. Uh, very ugly behavior. And I really do hate when teams use their leverage to squeeze their fans, which is what most teams do. We want to raise the prices, this and that. And I do get it. The money goes back into the players. It makes the product good, blah, blah, blah. But it really sucks when you get something that clear that just says, man, we don't fucking care about you. Take care of these people, Dodgers. All right? Do the right thing. Baseball is finally kind of cool again. I know m many of you listening are probably like, no. But in the sports world, let me tell you, it was worse. feels like there's more juice now. More teams could be in it this year. People are excited. There's a pitch clock. It's going faster. All right? The Dodgers have this generational talent who's also a degenerate gambler and doesn't care about the little guy at all. That's fun. People love that. I love when people say baseball is boring. I, I, I grew up playing baseball, all right? That was my, like, what I was good at in high school and, like, got me into college. We don't have to talk about all of it. But the point is, people always hit baseball with one thing, okay? Baseball and golf. I like both. They say baseball is boring. Yeah. It is. It's supposed to be. It's a different pace. It's a good, it's a good thing. I think it's a great thing in the modern environment. People are like, how are people going to keep watching baseball with like TikTok and people's brains are fried and they have no attention span? Exactly. We need baseball. You need something that you can kind of like, okay, this is a little bit slower. What if I actually focus on it? Baseball is one of those, it's like one of those, uh, you know, those things you look at and you cross your eyes and then it gets 3D. That's baseball. Okay, at first you're like, what is this stupid painting? And you like cross your eyes and you zoom in and you're like, oh, there's a whole world in there. Once you start watching a game and you're going, oh, it's a 3-1 count. Okay, well, I know that this hitter uh, likes fastballs and the pitcher's at a disadvantage in a 3-1 count, so he probably should throw a fastball, but the hitter's probably going to be sitting on a fastball. So if he can bend a curveball in there at 3-1, that would be awesome. But I don't know how his command has been with the curve. All this is happening, boom, then he pitches. But none of us are doing that. We're checking our phone. If you can do that, it becomes a very fascinating game. There's so much in there. Okay, this runner's on. He's speedy. That's going to put the pitcher in the stretch. I wonder if he, you know, I wonder if he rushes. He leaves the ball up too high. Boom, that's probably what led to the home run. There's so much there. So it's a good thing for you. You need baseball. You, lunatic, you need, you need to calm down and watch some more ball. It's good for you, all right? It's healthy. It's like the vegetables of sports. It's not going to be as exciting, but it's fun, all right? And then you get into the swing of things. And then every sport's different. Football's like a movie. There's one every week. Everything matters. You overreact to a win. Oh, my God, they won one game. They're the best. They lost one game. They're the worst. You have thoughts about it. You all sit down. You watch the whole thing. Everyone gets together for it. Football's a movie. Baseball's life. Baseball's like life. It's just there every day. Your favorite team is back. They're on almost every day. When they're not on, you're like, what the, where are my boys? I need them on. Baseball is not a movie. Baseball is a podcast, okay? It's going to be there for you consistently. But yeah, is each episode lower effort than a movie? Yeah. Do you need to sit and watch the whole thing and gather around? No. Can't imagine anyone's doing that right now. That would be crazy, all right? So I'm not saying this is some Scorsese-level shit. I'm just saying I had to get an ep out by tomorrow. It's Thursday. I'm going to be baseball for you. This is a podcast. I'm showing up. And maybe also like baseball, this can be a little boring sometimes, but it's good for you. You just got to sit and listen and dive in. All right? Baseball's boring. Well, not with great scandals. And that's what we have here. That's the sports section for the day. Moving on to internet. Now, internet... I want to find some more interesting, more niche tales for you uh, as, as, we, as we go through the internet. And we will do that at some point. But there was one thing that seemed to take over the internet this week, even though it's more of a culture story than an internet story, but at least in my circles, this was everything. This is the Kendrick Lamar, Drake, J. Cole beef. I'm sure you've heard about it. I'm sure you know where it stands. Uh... Kendrick hops on the song with, uh, with Future and Metro Boomin', which is the song of the moment. Um, like that, fantastic song. Drops a diss uh, to J. Cole and Drake. Motherfuck the big three. It's just big me. A word in there I can't say. Okay, they were supposedly the big three of rap. He's saying, no, it's just me. Honestly, 
Very good verse, mostly a really hot beat. Took over. That's everywhere. Even I was talking to friends of mine. I like Drake. Most people like Drake. My friends like, I love Drake. We all listen to that. We were like, fuck Drake for right now. For right now, eat it. Because that song's firing me up. And that's the point of rap beef. So J. Cole comes back. He disses Kendrick. He goes at his catalog. People are like, oh shit, J. Cole's back. Some people are like, that was stronger. That was weaker. It's normal rap beef. Then J. Cole goes to his concert and apologizes to Kendrick. And people have lost their minds. The uh, most recent thing that I saw right before recording is, is apparently Joe Budden is now saying that Drake has recorded his diss track. People are saying it's hot. It's coming back. The rap beef will continue. But what's interesting is J. Cole apologized. And that's what I'm interested in because people are freaking out that he apologized uh, in a rap beef. And it's a fascinating tale to me because it's not often that I can see people beefing at the highest levels of the rap game and totally relate to it. But J. Cole did what a lot of us do, okay? Something gets spicy, you sit down, you come back, you could be fighting with your, with your significant other, you could be fighting with a friend, Okay, you, you're going back and forth. You drop a fire bar and a text thread. You, 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 you set it all up and you shoot some venom. And when you're feeling mad about it, you're like, oh, I got him. And it feels good. And then if you're a good person, a little bit of time goes by and you just go, boy, do I feel yucky. And that's what J. Cole said. And that's very uncommon in a rap beef. And people are upset. People are like, that's not what rap beef is about. All right, you got to go at his head. You want to be the king? Like, rap is all about being number one. And apologizing does not fit with that. But I'm not surprised. J. Cole has never been the bravado rapper. He has. Look at his hair. Bro, he is... He has a few skin pigmentations from being like at lightning in a bottle, vibing on acid, just being like a DJ Wook who loves everybody. Dude, he is a vibes guy. He, I do think, is in touch with himself as a person. And he felt bad. And I related to that. I was like, yeah. Sometimes you, you, you throw something nasty at someone and you're like, I win. And then you're like, at what cost? That's not going to fly in the rap game. People are going to be upset by that. I heard people saying, uh, how could you bow out of a rap beef when it's the safest one of all time? Fair question. I don't think anyone's going to get capped there. But at the end of the day, he did it. I'm not surprised. He's a hippie. He is the hippie of rap. I think it's a beautiful thing. Uh, And, you know, I realize that beefing, I, I realize that they have their egos and they're mad at each other and there's a bunch of stuff that I'm not even read in on. Maybe you are, maybe you've dove deep, you understand the real nature of this, how it's been brewing for all these years and what it actually amounts to. Um, But I see it and I'm like, why are my friends mad? Why are my friends mad? Can't we all win? We're making millions to put together rhyming couplets. Why don't we, why don't we enjoy that? Why don't we realize we're blessed? Why don't we enjoy our lives? Now, I've never believed, I've always, this is the the conspiracy-minded me. Whenever rap beef comes up, I'm like, I don't know if that's real. I think that's too easy. Of course they're, of course they're doing this. It's selling tickets. We are talking about it. If they, if they each individually dropped three good tracks, I'm not here talking about this. This isn't a hip-hop review. I'm not Anthony Fantano. I'm not reviewing music. But once there's beef. All of a sudden, people who are casually interested can jump in. It's like how my baseball segment was not about like wins over replacement or statistics or who's good in the early season. You don't come to me for that. I'm not an expert. I'm here for that hot gossip. Okay, that's what you can sink your teeth into. Shohei Otani. Is he a piece of shit? Who knows? He doesn't even speak English. I can't tell. He seems to be very nice, but it could be all peace signs. I don't know. He could be a gambler who pressures fans. All right, that's not the point. The point is, I understand why you would do a rap beef. That's how, that's how you drive interest. It's how you drive sales. And it's a high-stakes game because if you lose, the entire public's going to call you a pussy. And that's not a good thing to be called in that game. So I get it. But when these things happen, I'm like, come on. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. It's pro wrestling. It's not real. They're, they're fucking around, and, and like they prob- they're laughing all the way to the bank. That's what I've always believed. But the apology made me kind of finally understand the 
the human level to it and how a lot of times a conspiracy is like, oh, because they're benefiting from this, it can't be real when it can also be both things. They are emotionally invested in this and they do want to win, but they also know they're engaging in something that's going to help. Kendrick couldn't just drop his next art piece and have as much interest as what's happening right now. But when J. Cole apologizes, the first I've ever been like, oh yeah, these hurt people's feelings. And I like that he apologized. I realized that people are going to say that's pussy shit and I'm a white boy wearing a Shakira shirt. So fine, maybe I'm not the target audience. But to me, that's relatable. Yeah, you said something spicy and then you're like, oh man, that doesn't feel so good. He was like, I got to protect my peace. That's a beautiful thing. We should all protect our peace. And I'm not just talking about wearing a cup. I'm talking about wearing a cup on your soul. All right? That matters. So I'm happy for J. Cole, even if he's going to get dragged for this. I think he's, look, I, I, I'm not the rap expert. I'm not going to say who's the best. My normie take is that, like, people who are super into rap will probably say Kendrick and casuals will probably say Drake and... Uh, then there's a bunch of people who just love J. Cole's vibe, and, and they're, they're the ones who are like, no, this shit's poetry, I guess I would assume. But I see J. Cole as he's almost like uh, the Clay Thompson of rap to me. Not to bring it back to sports and back to the Bay Area, but I know what I know. All right? Steph Curry is, is kind of the, the Drake in this scenario. And then Clay Thompson's kind of like the he's – you get him the ball, and he's sniping, and when he's hot – and I'm talking prime Clay. When he's hot, there's a lot of people like, is he the reason? Is he the one? Okay, but he's also a hippie. He's like, I got I to gotta be by the water. I saw him do an interview. He was like, someone was like, can you describe your connection with the water? And he's like, bro, what a good question. I'm a water sign. And I was like, wow, this basketball player is also into astrology. What a fascinating man. But he's just different. He's kind of, he moves different. He thinks different. He really does. He is kind of a gentler soul, you know? And he's not really the one leading the pack. He's not, he's not in the muck, but when he gets going, oh, man, is anyone as good as him? I think that's who J. Cole is, and there is nothing wrong with being Clay Thompson. I'd love to be the Clay Thompson of comedy. In fact, given the amount of lower body injuries I've had, broken left ankle twice, torn right Achilles, all in the prime of my career, will I bounce back? I think I have. I probably am the Clay Thompson of comedy. Um, okay. That that is it. One last note here. Uh, I do want to do one more culture piece. The uh, the curb your enthusiasm finale, the series finale hit, uh, and I would talk about it. I'd like to talk about, it, but I don't want to do spoiler alerts. I, it's only been a few days, um, so I just think uh, that show is so. I don't know if we're going to see anything like that again. It doesn't seem like comedies get to last this long. Um, it doesn't seem like comedies, especially like, I guess that's a, a situational comedy, seem to permeate the culture that way. And it makes sense that it's it's uh, still attached, you know, Larry David, obviously, co-creator of Seinfeld, it's still attached to that era. And it feels kind of like the last vestige of it. I hope there's another comedy that comes out weekly that my friends and I seem to all be watching at the same time. I don't know if that's going to happen. That feels like uh, that feels like it was something that was way bigger for a previous generation, and this was the last thing that this generation could even kind of hold on to. Uh, and that's a sad thing. I hope that's not true. I hope something even close to that can come back. But what a ride! I mean, it, there are few shows that have such a pure uh, perspective that like something in life will happen, and four of us at the same time will be like, "Oh wow, this feels like an episode of Curb." I mean, what a cool thing. Like, I was talking to someone about, like, like when someone cooks for you, this could have been a whole Curb episode. When someone cooks for you and you'd like a little hot sauce on it, but you realize that's, like, offensive because you're kind of overruling their flavors with a hot sauce. I know chefs just threw their AirPods out the fucking window. Hear me out. All right? You may have your own opinion, and it may be a disgrace to the food, but if you made something for me, don't you want me to enjoy it the most? And what if a little bit of hot sauce does that? Is that so offensive? Point is, that could be an entire episode because I could make that point, chefs get mad, boom, 30 minutes, Larry David. We all know it when we see it. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so in honor of Curb Your Enthusiasm, one of the great shows of all time, I want to introduce a new segment um, that hopefully we'll get to do, and this one's called Soapbox. Uh, so I want to have people on, just people from my life. Doesn't have to be a 
doesn't have to be an entertainer, doesn't have to be a guest. In fact, the first one's going to be completely anonymous. And I want them to just come on and talk about something that pisses them off or something they think society is missing or something they want to get up on their soapbox and defend and make a change and gripe and bitch about like Larry David himself. So my first guest is going to be anonymous, uh, but I want to do more of this. I want people to get on their soapbox and tell us things that should be in society that are not enough. Uh, and here's the first one. So my guest today needs no introduction because he's not getting one because uh, this one's anonymous, but the burning desire, the sensation to share this with the world uh, was strong enough that uh, I felt it was important to have him on. So, sir, my friend, would you like to explain uh, what you'd like to get off your chest today? Happy to explain it. This is very near to my heart. Mm-hmm. We need to have more hand jobs. <laughs> they, they need to happen more. And it's not as simple as, okay, hand jobs feel good. I get that. It's not the best sex act out there. Mm -hmm. I, probably sexual intercourse is the best one. Probably. Probably. I, it's, it's up for, we haven't run the bracket yeah, on if that. If someone else wants to come on and make a claim that it's not intercourse, fine. But just because steak is your favorite food doesn't mean you don't want a hamburger every once in a while. It's uh -huh. nice when the mood strikes. So you think we're in a world where the, the old fashioned, if you will, the H, the, the hand job, you think it's been frowned upon? It has absolutely been frowned upon by people who receive hand jobs, mm -hmm. but the crazier ungrateful. thing, ungrateful for one, but the crazier thing is how much it's been frowned upon by people who give hand jobs. The hand job provider. Yes. Like a hand job has, a, we have heard the response. Oh, they're too hard or, oh, you can jerk off whenever you want. Why would I give you a hand job? I, that's bullshit. I hate that. This is very common. A, very a common. lot of ladies say, I'd rather give you a subpar BJ than the best handy that I can give you because it's something you can do yourself. You don't believe it. And that's this. an excuse. That's a crutch. Like, <laughs> learn a, learn to deal with a dick with your hand because it's nice. It's, it's like pleasant. driving a manual. Yeah. It's a lost art. <laughs> it is a lost art. <laughs> They're all automatic <laughs> these days. I, had, I asked for a hand job one time. You did? I asked for a hand job, and the girl told me, that she didn't hook up until she was older, so she skipped the hand job phase. There is the hand job. The hand job development phase is it is like a spring training for the season sort of thing. Two problems there. One, I don't think we need to advance beyond the hand job to be too good for the hand job. And two, it's crazy to me that you're like, oh, I never figured out how I, how to give a hand job, so I decided to just shove the whole thing in my mouth. Like that, <laughs> like that was an easier alternative. No, not at all. A blowjob is so much worse for the giver. It's harder. You're basically doing a hand job at the same time. That is true. You're really adding on top. Yeah. It's, it's not a good. So you're kind of a minimalist. You think less is more. I you think, think we're adding too much. I think a good hand job can be exceptional. Mm -hmm. a, a good blow job is like a crab cake. Like the good ones. <laughs> are pretty good the bad ones are also pretty, pretty good. good you've never had a crab cake that you're like oh my god this is better than every other crab cake i've ever had no they're all like pretty good <laughs> but you have had that hand job you absolutely like wow. this is the best hand job i've ever had it's really? like an egg salad sandwich right now, like a great one is amazing and a bad one is really bad like not good <laughs> now what do you think constitutes what makes uh, a great hand job so great i the best part about a hand job for the giver is that there are only two ways you can screw it up and you can fix a bad hand job with two words which are faster and looser <laughs> there are literally only two ways to screw up a hand job and all you have to do is provide either one or both of those words and it will get better immediately wow wow okay this is this is very so you like a just a loose a loose and swift crank well too loose you got you know of course you gotta of course, be feeling something now do, do you prefer this uh even as an appetizer or do you like it when it's a main course i like it as an appetizer i think it's more common to have it happen as an appetizer correct occasionally it's, it's, you'll it's get rare a, that you the, the as an adult who's not in the back of like your you know honda civic right. It is rare that that's the right. whole thing. You'll get a few. Down. You'll get a few strokes, which is a big part of this whole stance. Yeah, I don't want a few strokes. 
I want a hand job to completion beginning to end. Okay. That's an important element to the whole thing. I like the idea of the hand job being the whole experience. The whole thing. The whole thing. One egg salad yeah. sandwich to <laughs> right. rule them all. Exactly. The best you've ever had. And you have requested this. How does it go when you request this specifically? Well, I'm a little shy. I've only requested it a handful of times. And pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> The only response I have ever gotten is I'm not that good at that or I want to do other stuff. And do you come back with like a, you got to believe in yourself. I've occasionally encouraged some women to have more faith in their hand job abilities. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> have you ever, do you think it, is there a risk of injury there? Like a tennis elbow sort of thing. If this really takes off and they start sweeping the nation, is there going to be like an increase in Tommy John surgery among uh, young hot women? I in New wasn't York? imagining tennis elbow, but uh, I think the potential for an injury in a blowjob or in sex is, is way is higher. Yeah. So if we're worried about injury risk, let's go with the hand job. Do you feel like the the natural kind of competitor, like the real the limiting factor for the hand job is the blow job? That seems more of like because I think intercourse is I mean, that's a classic. Let's be honest. You know, maybe every once in a while that's never going to that's not going anywhere. Right. I think that's a classic. Right. I think that's well established. I think. I would be very surprised if the hand job overtook the blow job, mm -hmm. but you'd be very happy. That's not. I, I don't even know if that's my entirely my goal. I just want there to be more hand jobs. More hand jobs. I want more hand jobs out there yeah. in the world. Now, when there you, aren't enough at all. When you're in a committed relationship, is this uh, something that you sit down with the person and you tell them, hey, this is kind of a thing? Or do you feel like you kind of just want it to happen? You don't want to have to instruct. I, little, a little bit of both. Yeah. I'm not in a committed relationship. So Correct. But you be, have been in your life. Yeah, I have and been I, in I my don't life. know how, how long has this hand job theory been a part of your I, life? So, Always. 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 From day one. From day one. Wow. From day one. The handyman. From, <laughs> <laughs> from when I learned that I could give myself a hand job, I said it would be nice if someone else would do this for me. Adam Handler. <laughs> it's, and I'm continuing the sandwich analogy that I just came up with. How much better is a sandwich that somebody else made for you than the sandwich that you make for yourself? Even if it's the same ingredients and everything, there's something about the fact that somebody else did it. You can, Only someone else can add love to a hand job. <laughs> right. And right. that's the real secret ingredient. Exactly. Love, a little bit of speed, a little bit of looseness, <laughs> the one, two, three punch. We're off and running. The, well, world, the world's a better place. This is beautiful. <laughs> I, I really hope that this uh, has some impact. And I, I want to thank you for sharing your, your, your soul with us. Uh, and uh, ladies out there, you heard it here first. You don't need to have a mouthful when you can just have a quick little jerk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and there it is. That is our show for the day. Uh, very different one. We will be back to uh, how it has run next week with a guest. Um, so excited for that. But if you like this, uh, let me know and write in some soapboxes. Okay, write in some rants. We, we may even have some of you call in, but the email for that is joeyshowpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, please uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. Right now it's on my main channel. Um, eventually we'll probably switch over to uh, the Joey Show podcast channel, so give that uh, a subscribe as well so you're ready when that happens. Uh, and I'm on tour. So this weekend, uh, Thursday through Saturday, five shows in Washington, D.C., uh, then, uh, going to Arizona, the April 27th and 28th may or may not be going to Austin before that for some pop in shows, Norfolk, Nebraska, May two and three Fargo, North Dakota, May 17 and 18 Dallas comedy club, June 14 and 15 just announced Santiago, San Diego. Yes. This has been a much requested one. And we're getting three shows in on a weekend. This is at Mike Drop Comedy, July 12th and 13th. Uh, ooh, and we have Edmonton up. I am returning to Edmonton, uh, House of Comedy, uh, or sorry, the, the comic strip in Edmonton, October 3rd to the 6th. Uh, so what a time to be alive, folks. Please come out and see a live show. They are so much goddamn fun. I love you guys. Uh, if you made it this far into a solo episode, goddamn. I love you the most. Uh, we'll see you next week. Be good. Thank God I have a podcast.
Thank you.